You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Hey, y'all. Spooky season is here. And if you're looking for a show to whet your appetite for a little haunted history, then I'd like to invite you to check out Southern Gothic, a chart-topping history podcast that explores some of the most infamous legends, folklore, ghost stories, and hauntings of the American South. We've covered all sorts of stuff from the Bell Witch of Tennessee to the disappearance of the Confederate submarine, the H.L. Hunley, not to mention our deep dives into the local lore of some of America's oldest and most haunted cities like New Orleans, Charleston, and St. Augustine. So if you're ready for a little good old-fashioned Halloween storytelling with a commitment to quality historical research, then be sure to check out Southern Gothic today. It's available now on all your favorite podcast apps. Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to episode 197 of our Civil War podcast. I'm Rich. And I'm Tracy. Hello y'all. Welcome to the podcast. Previously on the show, we looked at round one of the fighting for the Sunken Road during the Battle of Antietam as the 2nd Corps Division of William French advanced against the Confederate position and was thrown back with heavy losses. Continuing the unfortunate federal pattern of piecemeal attacks, Israel Richardson's division now arrived on the scene after the last of French's men fell back in defeat. Richardson's 4,000 Second Corps veterans might well have been used to exploit the foothold George Green had won in the West Woods near the Dunker Church, but there was no guiding hand for the federal effort on this side of Antietam Creek. As his army continued to make uncoordinated and unsupported attacks on this part of the battlefield, McClellan was still at his headquarters back at the Pry House, where he was making no effort to direct operations or shape the action here, and consequently events would play out as they would. With no one to tell him otherwise, Richardson moved his division southward to join French's battered force in front of the sunken road. At the same time that Israel Richardson's division was swinging into action against the sunken road, there was a brief flurry of gunfire from the south in the direction of the lower bridge. You see, when McClellan had finally released Richardson's division to cross the Antietam, he had also decided it might be time to bring the Ninth Corps into play. A courier from McClellan had reached Ambrose Burnside's headquarters shortly before 10 a.m. with the order for the Ninth Corps to launch its attack on the lower bridge. Burnside, still acting like a wing commander with no wing to command, passed along the order to 9th Corps Commander Jacob Cox. The plan was to test the rebel defenses at the lower bridge with a straight-ahead charge by Colonel George Crook's brigade of the Kanawha Division, which had recently joined the Army of the Potomac after campaigning in western Virginia. The 11th Connecticut would form a regiment-sized skirmish line along the creek bank to open the way for Crook's assault column. At the same time, the division of Brigadier General Isaac P. Rodman, reinforced by the 2nd Kanawha Brigade, would set off downstream, aiming to cross the Antietam two-thirds of a mile below the bridge at a ford that McClellan's engineers had picked out the day before. By crossing at the ford, they would take the bridge's defenders on the flank. The remaining two Ninth Corps divisions would stand by, ready to exploit the breakthrough once the bridge was taken. It seemed to be a simple, sound plan, yet nearly everything went wrong. There was no doubt that seizing the lower bridge would be a difficult task. The road came down from Sharpsburg through a hollow to reach the Antietam upstream from the bridge, then ran along the stream bank before turning sharply to cross the bridge, and then ran southward again, close by the bank on the federal side of the creek, for a quarter of a mile before angling off to Pleasant Valley. 
On both sides of the stream were steep hills, with those on the Confederate side sloping right down to the water's edge. The bridge itself was a three-arch stone span, 125 feet long and 12 feet wide. Although there were 12,500 men in the Ninth Corps, only a small fraction of them could attempt to storm the bridge at one time, since the road, the terrain, and the bridge itself all worked to create a narrow bottleneck the attackers would be forced to funnel through. Little Mac had inspected the site the day before and admitted capturing the bridge would be a, quote, difficult task. McClellan promised Burnside that once the Ninth Corps was across the Antietam, it would be supported by troops from the reserve who would cross upstream at the middle bridge. Defending the lower bridge were 400 Confederates of the 2nd and 20th Georgia under Colonel Henry L. Benning. Benning's nickname was Old Rock and suggested the stubbornness of any defense he would lead. His men were well dug in and their position commanded every approach to the bridge at a range of no more than a 100 yards. Five rebel batteries backed them up on high ground to their rear. The Georgians anchored their position in the cuts of an old quarry on the steep hillside that directly overlooked the creek and behind a stone wall along the water's edge, and it was obvious to the Yankees that a great deal of firepower would be needed to dislodge these rebels. It was four hours since Hooker had opened the fighting on the northern part of the battlefield, and any possible benefit to be gained from a diversion by the Ninth Corps in this sector on the Federal left had long since disappeared. Because McClellan had failed to coordinate the actions of the different parts of his army, nothing had prevented Robert E. Lee from ordering all the Confederate troops he dared to spare to move from this sector up to reinforce his other flank. By this time, since there was no longer any benefit to the Ninth Corps simply making a diversion here at the lower bridge, and since the Federal attack on the northern end of the battlefield had run into serious trouble, that meant McClellan now decided he urgently needed Burnside to quickly get the Ninth Corps over the creek to not just make a diversion, but to actually open a whole new front that Robert E. Lee would be forced to defend. But the high command of the Ninth Corps was afflicted by a seeming mental paralysis on the day of the battle, beginning at the top with Ambrose Burnside. In his sullen determination to obey orders from headquarters to the letter and nothing more, he made no preparations for Ninth Corps' role in the battle. Not a single reconnaissance was carried out in this sector by Ninth Corps officers. In addition, Rodman's flanking column wasn't advanced to its, to its fording site to be ready to cross the creek the moment the order was received to do so. In the confusing command situation, Cox took no more initiative than Burnside. As it was, only the skirmishers of the 11th Connecticut actually carried out their part in the attack plan, and they discovered soon enough that the closer they approached the bridge, the more vulnerable they became. One company attempted to wade the creek and was picked off almost to the last man, including the company commander. The regiment's colonel was struck by four bullets and mortally wounded. After a third of the Connecticut boys were hit, the rest retreated. Meanwhile, Colonel Crook's storming party somehow got lost in the woods. Eventually, it appeared 350 yards upstream from the bridge, where it spent the next few hours firing at the rebel skirmishers across the creek. Rodman's 3,200-man flanking force experienced equally embarrassing difficulties. It discovered that the spot where it was supposed to cross was unusable for artillery and even infantry because of the rocky bottom and high banks at that spot. When the Federals had first arrived in front of Sharpsburg, local civilians had told them of Snavely's Ford, a good crossing downstream from the lower bridge, but no one in the Ninth Corps had made the effort to locate it. This was normally a matter for cavalry, but with McClellan holding all of the Union horsemen in reserve, they hadn't been available for reconnaissance, and the engineers from headquarters sent out to scout for the crossing had bungled the job. 
So now, with Rodman's flanking force stalled, a party was belatedly sent out, and Snavely's ford was finally located, but it would be a hard two-mile march from Rodman's current position, so it was going to be some time before a quarter of the Ninth Corps was going to be able to get into action. While Burnside and Cox waited for word of some sort of progress from Rodman, they couldn't think of anything better to do than order the bridge to be stormed a second time. Brigadier General James Nagel's brigade was picked for this attempt. To prevent anyone getting lost, the approach would be along the creek bank on the road leading to the bridge, with the 2nd Maryland in the lead. Every federal artillery piece in the vicinity was brought into action to blast the rebel defenders across the creek. As the charge began, the divisional commander, Brigadier General Samuel Sturgis, was heard blistering one of his colonels, shouting, "'God damn you to hell, sir!' Don't you understand the English language? I ordered you to advance in line with the 2nd Maryland, and what in hell are you doing flanking around here in the corn? With bayonets fixed, the Marylanders charged down the road at double quick time toward the bridge 250 yards away. There wasn't a shred of cover against the fierce flanking fire from the Confederate infantry and artillery across the creek, and in perhaps a minute and a half the regiment lost 45% of their number. Against this storm of fire, the 2nd Maryland had little chance of reaching the bridge, and finally they broke off their charge and ran for cover. At about 11 a.m., an observer's report was forwarded to Little Mac, telling him, quote, He says he cannot see that Burnside has done a thing. He sent two regiments to cross the bridge and were driven back like sheep by the enemy's artillery. What's something you learned in history class that you feel wasn't the whole truth? Better yet, what's something you didn't learn at all that was omitted completely? That's what I like to call redacted history. I believe that all history, no matter how good or bad, needs to be told. There are wars, massacres, battles, and entire historical events that are just not in our school's history books. Have you ever heard of Mary Bowser? I didn't think so. My name is Andre White, the host of the Redacted History Podcast, the place where history's forgotten events, heroes, and villains get their story told, one episode at a time. So come huddle around the campfire with me and get ready to hear the stories that you were robbed of. And get comfortable. We're going to be here a while. The Redacted History Podcast. Real history never dies. Stream the Redacted History Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasts. History never says goodbye. It just says, see you later. Edward Galliano was right when he said that. Events keep happening over and over again in some form. And that's the reason I produce the podcast, My History Can Beat Up Your Politics. What is it? We take stories of history and apply them to the events of today to help you perhaps understand them better. We are also part of Airwave Media Network. I've been doing the program since 2006. That's a long time. And the show has a long name. My History Can Beat Up Your Politics. Find me wherever you get podcasts. As the grim results of the ferocious fighting against the Confederate left and center reached the Pry House, Little Mac had grown increasingly impatient with Burnside's seeming inactivity down on the Federal left. Messengers were hurried off to speed the Ninth Corps' movement. This, in turn, irritated Burnside, who snapped at one of the couriers, saying, quote, "'McClellan appears to think I am not trying my best to carry this bridge. You are the third or fourth one who has been to me this morning with similar orders.'" As Burnside's initial efforts to seize the lower bridge were ending in failure, the action in the Confederate center at the sunken road was heating up once again as Israel B. Richardson's 2nd Corps Division joined the fight. As Richardson's Federals were arriving on the scene, on the Confederate side, Richard H. Anderson's division came up to support D.H. Hill. 
Anderson's troops were the last of Robert E. Lee's battlefield reserves, and so, with the exception of A.P. Hill's men, who were at that very moment marching to Sharpsburg from Harper's Ferry, the entire Army of Northern Virginia was now committed to the battle. As Anderson's men came up to support D.H. Hill, rebel artillery batteries were also being shifted to aid in the defense of this critical sector, and once again the Confederate guns achieved a tactical edge and firepower at the front, at the point where the infantry were locked in combat. The first of Richardson's units to swing into action was the Irish Brigade, going into battle under its emerald banners. Brigadier General Thomas Marr commanded the brigade. He was a flamboyant Irish revolutionary who had been exiled to the island of Tasmania by the English. Somehow Marr had escaped and made his way to America. In New York City, he had recruited his three Irish regiments, the 63rd, 69th, and 88th New York, and he led them through the hottest fighting on the peninsula. During the campaign, the 29th Massachusetts, which was mostly made up of Boston Blue Bloods, joined the brigade, and so the celebrated formation's actual Irish content was reduced to 75%. Marr, heavily fortified with whiskey, put his men in on the left of what remained of French's division. Back and forth across the front of the Irish Brigade rode one of the regimental chaplains, Father William Corby, who shouted the words of absolution for those about to die. Then Marr ordered his men forward against the sunken road. Waiting for the Yankees, D.H. Hill's Confederates rested their muskets on their fence-rail breastworks and then opened fire, tearing the Federal attack to shreds. More than half the Irish Brigade was shot down in a matter of minutes. Marr himself was spared because he was so drunk he toppled from his horse and was carried from the field. Like French's troops before them, the Irish Brigade survivors fell back behind the crest of the ridge and lay down to maintain a fire against the rebels, defending the sunken road. With hardly a pause, Richardson put in Brigadier General John C. Caldwell's brigade on Mars' left. Richardson had earned a reputation for reckless bravery during the Mexican War, and he often told the men of his division that he would never send them into any action where he himself was unwilling to go. Now, proving he had meant what he said, Richardson came up on foot right behind the firing line to encourage his troops. One of the men recalled how Richardson's face was, quote, as black as a thundercloud, end quote, as he cursed Caldwell, who someone said was back hiding behind a haystack. Fresh troops appeared on the Confederate side as well, as more of Dick Anderson's men arrived on the scene to back up D.H. Hill. It was close to noon, and the Federal pressure along the half-mile front at the sunken road was beginning to tell on the defenders. As seen from east of the Antietam at the Pry House, the panorama of battle was a spectacular sight. A newspaper correspondent wrote, On the great field were riderless horses and scattering men, clouds of dirt from exploding shells, long dark lines of infantry, and white puffs from the batteries, with the sun shining brightly on this on all this scene of tumult. Dick Anderson's 3,400 reinforcements would have seemed to ensure solid support for the Confederate defenders of the sunken road, but the ground behind the road, on the farm of Henry Piper, sloped upward, and so the approach of the rebel reinforcements was in plain view and well within range of the Federal infantry, whose attacks against the road had been beaten off. When those frustrated Yankees saw Anderson's rebels coming up, they directed a heavy fire at them. The big Union guns across the Antietam also opened fire on this tempting target. As Anderson's division struggled forward through this storm of musketry and artillery fire, the most serious loss was Dick Anderson himself, who went down with a bad wound almost the moment he reached the scene of the fighting. With Anderson down, Brigadier General Roger A. Pryor took over. Pryor was a former lawyer, newspaper editor, and congressman, and he was also one of the most vocal fire-eaters who had pushed his native Virginia towards secession. But while he had been confident and successful in civilian life, Pryor, here at Antietam, would prove that commanding a division in the midst of battle was not one of his many talents. As Ezra Carman notes, quote, 
R. H. Anderson had been wounded very soon after coming upon the field, and Pryor, who succeeded to command, was unaware of the orders under which Anderson was acting, and did not rise to the occasion, and the consequent movements of his command were disjointed and without proper direction. On the right side of the Confederate line in the sunken road, there was a growing sense of confusion that began when the brigade commander there, another Confederate Anderson, George B. Anderson, had his ankle shattered by a bullet, a wound that would prove fatal. Anderson's successor also was mortally wounded. In a sad postscript to what Tracy just said about Anderson's being wounded at Antietam, uh, he would be carried from the field and then would travel home to North Carolina to be nursed by his pregnant wife. His wound became infected, though, and despite the amputation of his leg, he died on October 16th, just one day before the birth of his daughter. Very sad. But back in the sunken road, as reinforcements pushed down into the road and found little room there, Colonel Carno Posey decided to take his newly arrived brigade of Mississippians right through the crowd in the road in a counterattack against the Yankees beyond. But Posey quickly discovered he'd bitten off more than he could chew, and his men were thrown back with heavy losses. The repulse of this ill-advised charge started a chain reaction that would ultimately lead to the Confederates losing the sunken road. As the Mississippians fell back into the sunken road, Posey tried to extricate them from the increasingly confused mass of rebel troops there. But as Posey tried to pull just his troops out of the road, the retrograde movement was quickly beyond his control, and word started to spread along the line like wildfire that the entire position was being abandoned. Suddenly, Confederates by the hundreds began to clamber out of the road and run for the rear. The Yankees redoubled their fire at this rush of targets. As the tide of rebel fugitives swept into and through the Piper cornfield and orchard, they carried many of the milling reinforcements from Dick Anderson's division back with them. A similar confusion caused the left end of the Confederate position in the sunken road to collapse at almost the same moment. The one exposed segment of the rebel line was the shallow angle where the road turned to the southeast. Not only was the road here close to ground level, affording the defenders little protection, but as Mars and Caldwell's Federals extended the enemy battle line, the Confederate troops in the angle came under an increasingly deadly enfilading fire. Skillful federal maneuvering added to the rebels' troubles, as Colonel Francis C. Barlow, who commanded two understrength regiments, the 61st and the 64th New York, led his men to a little knoll that looked down the length of that section of the road, and from that excellent vantage point, they poured a lethal fire down into the hapless Confederate defenders. A sergeant in the 61st New York said simply, quote, We were shooting them like sheep in a pen. Hardest hit was the 6th Alabama of Rhodes' Brigade, and after the 6th Alabama's colonel, John B. Gordon, went down with his fifth wound of the day, the lieutenant colonel, replacing Gordon, went to Rhodes to explain the situation and get orders. Rhodes told him to fold back or refuse the regiment's right flank to face the threat more directly, but the man apparently misunderstood this instruction because when he returned to the regiment, he gave the order to about face and forward march. Hearing this clear implication of retreat, the commander of the next regiment in line asked if it was meant for the whole brigade. Incredibly, he was assured that it was, and so in a moment's time, all five of Rhodes' regiments were promptly scrambling out of the sunken road and hightailing it for the rear. Just then, Robert Rhodes was assisting a wounded staff officer, and by the time he realized what was happening, he was powerless to stop the retreat. And so, when added to the collapse on the right of the rebels' position in the sunken road, this mistake meant that the entire center of Robert E. Lee's line was broken wide open. The Federals of the Second Corps, watching this development from their position on the crest of the ridge above the sunken road, now charged forward with a cheer. 
The 2nd and 14th North Carolina tried to make a last stand in the road, but were hit from two directions and broken. A blue wave of Federals rushed across the sunken road and into the Piper cornfield beyond. Lieutenant Thomas Livermore of the 5th New Hampshire said, quote, In this road there lay so many dead rebels that they formed a line which one might have walked upon as far as I could see. End quote. A soldier from the 8th Ohio came upon Colonel Charles II, commander of the 2nd North Carolina, propped up against the northern bank of the road. Two had received a gruesome wound when he was shot in the head, and he appeared dead, with his sword clutched in his hands. But when the Yankee soldier reached for Two's sword to claim it as a battle trophy, the Confederate officer instinctively summoned the last of his strength and drew the sword toward his body. Then he pitched forward, dead. While the Federals were regrouping in the sunken road, their right flank was briefly threatened from the rear by the 27th North Carolina and 3rd Arkansas, which were led by Colonel John R. Cook. These rebels had helped pursue Green's Federals out of the West Woods, and as y'all might recall, we said that we would hear from them again, and well, here they are. Longstreet had ordered the two regiments to advance from the vicinity of the West Woods in order to threaten the rear of the Federals at the sunken road. As Cook's 675 men gamely moved forward in response to Longstreet's orders, a soldier stepped out of the ranks of the 3rd Arkansas. He had a request for his captain. Sir, would it be all right if I kind of give the boys a tune as they move out? I got my fiddle with me. The captain agreed, and he asked for the old square dance tune, Granny, Will Your Dog Bite? And so, with the fiddle player sawing away, the third Arkansas moved out. Dog bite, dog bite, granny, will you dog bite? No child, no. Granny, will you dog bite? Dog bite, dog bite. Johnny cut his bite off a long time ago. But Cook's attack was doomed from the start. When Colonel John Brooke, commanding the Federals in the 3rd of Israel Richardson's brigades, saw the rebels approaching, he countered it by moving to his right. The heavy Federal fire stopped Cook's attack, forcing him to retreat west of the Hagerstown Turnpike after having lost more than half of his men. Among the Confederate dead was the Arkansas fiddle player. Meanwhile, Israel Richardson's blood was up, and he was determined to exploit the breakthrough at the sunken road and he drove troops forward relentlessly, out of the road, and on into the Piper cornfield beyond, collaring units of French's division, as well as his own, to keep the pursuit moving. Lieutenant Livermore admitted, quote, I shall never cease to admire that magnificent fighting general who advanced with his front line. The breakthrough was clearly visible from the Pry House. A Boston newspaper man later described the scene by writing, quote, Ah, what a crash! A white cloud, gleams of lightning, a yell, a hurrah, and then up in the cornfield a great commotion, men firing into each other's faces, the Confederate line breaking, the ground strewn with prostrate forms, the Confederate line in Bloody Lane has been annihilated, the center pierced. A member of McClellan's staff, David Strother, wrote that he was standing near Little Mac during the climax of the vicious fighting for the sunken road, quote, And when it was over, he exclaimed, By George, this is a magnificent field, and if we win this fight, it will cover all our errors and misfortunes forever. That means it's time for this episode's book recommendation. And our recommendation this time is The Gleam of Bayonets, The Battle of Antietam, and Robert E. Lee's Maryland Campaign, September 1862, by James V. Murphan. 
Murfin's book is considered the classic account of the battle, which is a nice way of saying uh, it's a bit dated, but it's still worth checking out. Um, yeah. All right. Don't forget you can always find a complete list of all of our book recommendations if you head over to the podcast website, which is www.civilwarpodcast.org. And then as we wrap things up for this show, just a quick shout out to the newest members of the Strawfoot Brigade, Alexander, Craig, and Paul. And thanks to Philip M. from Pittsburgh for his generous donation to the podcast. And thanks to all of you for listening to this episode of The Civil War, 1861 to 1865, a history podcast. Tracy and I do hope you'll join us again next time as we continue with the story of the Battle of Antietam. But until then, take care. Thanks, everyone. Bye.